What's going on everybody? Lil Chris here and welcome back for another pool coaching video. As you can see, I am rejoined by Demetrius from MN Pool Bootcamp. What's going on, bud? You're what's going on, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Always. Thanks for joining me for another edition of coaching here. Uh, the video that we are reviewing is over a year old. So to the shooter, uh, whose name is Nier. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's N-I-R. I do apologize for this taking so freaking long uh, to get to. But um, hopefully what we can do here is that even though it's been a year, I would assume that you've had some form of improvements in your game to where things we might mention off of this review, you might already be correcting. But then, of course, there is the possibility that we still might be able to mention some things that you're currently not implementing in your game. That's what we're hopefully going to benefit from the most for yourself and for us and, of course, for the viewers. But before we get started with that, Demetrius, give us a little plug of the uh, of the boot camp. Yeah, uh, everyone, I run a uh, three day pool boot camp. I actually put it together uh, a couple of years ago because something I wanted to do. And it's something I do on my own is, uh, you know, I think anybody that, that goes to tournaments, you know, plays leagues, has a table at home, puts a lot into this game for years. Uh, I, it's like, let's take one week at one time, you know, and, and just dedicate it to training. So I used to do this. I, I went to eight to 10 tournaments a year and I was like, why don't I ever just take three days, get away from everything, put my head down and really work on my game. And so I started doing that with a really good friend of mine who's a top player. And, uh, you know, once every year or two, we'd get together and just train for three days. So I wanted something like that. and I didn't see it out there. So I started doing these three day boot camps uh, a few years ago. I've been doing it full time about two years now. I've had over 50 people come and train with me and it's been a lot of fun. Uh, I take players from anywhere in the country because you fly into Minnesota, stay. I've got a room right here next to my pool table. Uh, you stay with me. I, you know, you eat. Here, you we train for just three days. You get to make your life about training pool one on one. And, you know, I look at what level you're at on the different skills. And at the beginning, we make a plan and like, okay, where are we at with shot making? Where are we at with cue ball? Where are we at with patterns? Where are we at with moving? Where are we at with breaking? Where are we, you know, like, where are we at on the different parts of the game? We make a plan and then we start, you know, filling in gaps in knowledge, gaps in technique, and, and being able to, you know, control the cue ball and being able to plan and assemble runouts. Uh, and then we don't just talk about like, okay, here's some drills to go work on. Good luck. Like then we have time to actually do it side by side so that you're growing and developing these skills. And then we're putting it together where, where we run through, you know, balls better and better, whether they're eight ball racks, nine ball racks, whatever. And so we do it side by side so that I actually get you going on the right road so that when you leave here, you have seen some improvement and you have some ideas on things you can keep doing on your own to continue down the path that you're already on. So that's what we do. I get pretty excited about it. Uh, please look up my website. It's MN, like Minnesota. It's mnpoolbootcamp.com. Um, come on up and uh, yeah, reach out to me and we'll get, we'll get you on the calendar for 2022. And anybody that's been following me knows that I've been to that boot camp. And as I've previously stated in past videos, when I went to Demetrius, I was only about a 620 Fargo. And since then, I've now jumped up to about 643. And I can honestly say I did not do that by myself. The stuff that Demetrius was able to give to me was valuable. So if it helps me, it can certainly help you. Well, now, thank you, Chris. Yep, no problem. Now, with that being said... What we're going to do here, though, is we're going to watch uh, Nier, and again, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, play through um, three racks of eight ball. Uh, he is actually a snooker player. He's been playing snooker for about 15 years um, and only recently was starting to get more into pool and obviously recently meaning maybe a year ago, possibly even more since this video is over a year old. Uh, so what he's hoping to uh, get from us is hopefully some – maybe some better pattern selections. I don't know if we're going to be able to point out any type of 
technique issues considering that he has a 15 year background in schnooker so i'm pretty sure we're going to see maybe uh an open hand bridge probably throughout the entire match uh we can't really see his feet because you can see we have this um overview um look of his table and it's, it looks like it's got a fisheye overview that's why the rails look uh, a little bent um, i'm assuming this might be an old style gopro or just maybe uh some type of camera that basically gives you a fisheye view rather than a uh linear view uh so hopefully what we can see here is try to figure out is there different types of patterns that he could have run? And then, of course, maybe different types of strategies because we don't know if he's going to try to play safeties on himself or if he's just going to try to break and run the table on every on, on every try. But what he is going to be doing is going to be playing by the um, APA format. So whatever uh, ball he makes on the break, provided that he does not make one of each, he will be that set. So if he makes only a stri uh, stripe on the break, he'll be a stripe. If he makes only a solid, he'll be a solid. If it's open, it'll be open. And then we get to see really what his pattern selection is going to be from there. Now, with Demetrius plugging his boot camp, what I decided to do with uh, this coaching lesson here is I'm going to let Demetrius run the entire show. And I might mention an obligatory comment uh, here and there. So <laughs> with all that in mind, Demetrius, let's get started with the first rack. All right, let's roll it. Now, they don't have a break shot in Snooker, so I'm curious to see uh, how he's developed his break. All right, let's have a look. Pretty much dead center. Pretty nice, pretty smooth. You know, it wasn't overpowering, but it, was, uh, it wasn't jerky. So let's see here. Looks like a dry break. And so... Because of the uh, the speed of the hit, it does look like there's a lot of congestion. Let's see. What, so we could choose either suit here. So that I guess we look for problem balls, right? So if he takes stripes, he's got the 12, the 11. Actually, everything's a problem except for the 10 is the only open ball, and that's wedged up on the head rail. So then if we take solids, see now he's, uh, he's shooting already, where based on the difficulty of this table, um, I think I would have needed a little bit more time to come to grips with what my long-term plan was. Um, I could have certainly identified an open shot to pocket, but I don't know that I would have had a winning plan for the whole table. So a little quicker than I'd go. Cause I, I, I like to have a, a plan from start to finish before I burst into action, but okay. Now it seems like he's got the one ball. And then if you leg the one ball in, you can roll a foot or two forward, maybe get even with the seven. The seven looks like it goes on the side, and you might even be able to play your cue ball off the side rail, end rail, maybe even open up some balls, like a little breakout. Let's see what he does. You could also kind of slide this in with a – yeah, this is kind of what I had in mind. Now, he went a little further, but that's okay. So I think he might have been trying to get on the three, but now he's got the seven ball. If he were to try to follow one rail into the cluster to open things up, the 12 is in the way – the 813 is in the way, but if you shoot like a, I don't know, you might be able to kind of stun around with like a left spin. We'll see what he does here. He's going to have to open these balls up though, the five and the four. Okay, he's just trying to get out this three ball. And we still got the six up table, which got a little tougher after he thinned that 11, huh? If I, if I had to guess, he's not finishing solids uh, in this inning. It's looking pretty tough, right? You'd have to shoot the three legally without hitting the 14. I think you're going to need to use a high ball so that you go through the 14 a little bit, maybe over towards that 13, and you have to hope to get a little bit fortunate. He's going for it. Let's see if we can catch if it's a clean hit. Well, you got a good hit, but maybe. And slops it in. <laughs> oh, APA rules. APA rules. <laughs> All right. I forgot. Okay. So, well, now everything, that, that worked. So now if he could get straight on the five ball, he could roll forward for the four on the side and then the eight in the bottom right corner as we look at the screen. But if you have an angle on the five ball, then that's going to create problems. So I think you need to be between the 11 and the side rail. So I would use a straight stun shot here 
to come right where his bridge hand is, right to the end rail and then back up kind of in between the 11 and the side rail. You might have to accept a little distance, but not too much. And I think that's what he was, well, this is still workable. A little, little uh, close call, but okay. So now here again, you just have to like leg this in, right? Because if you roll too far, you don't want to get beyond the nine or on the end rail. So then some people like to use a drag shot where they hit below center and let the spin wear off. Um, other people just like to use kind of a center ball roll. From this distance, I wouldn't mind seeing a dray shot. I think, let's see if he cues low. You know, I couldn't really tell on my screen if he did or not. To me, that looked like a drag shot. It did, just based on the speed, right? On mm -hmm. the speed. So I think that was the right shot. And uh, it's unfortunate he just didn't quite put it down. Okay. So now my first thought, okay, I'll just tell you my first thought, because you're dealing with a mess. I'm not shooting a long, hard 11 ball where if I miss, I could lose. Uh, this, I, I don't know, maybe I would. Maybe that's your only choice. But I'd be, I'd be immediately thinking about, like, finding a way to pocket that five and play safe or something. Oh, maybe I would have drawn off the nine. But it's risky. You don't want to follow it in. But anyway, I just, yeah, okay. This is, uh, he got to where he can't make the five, though, huh? Can, can he make this four just barely past the nine and maybe pick it up rail first? I think it, I think it all squeeze, squeezes by. It's going to be a combo. Oh, it does. Or oh, no. One. <laughs> he got it. He got it. Okay, I thought he rolled too far for a minute. Okay, well. Perfect. Nice. Well. Not so much that he was able to do there uh, with stripes uh, after uh, missing uh, that five ball. Uh, but do you see any particular areas that you might want to try to uh, dive a little deeper on? Yeah, sure. Let's let's take a look at it, Chris. All right, Chris. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is the break shot. Now, before I even started seeing this, the first thing I said was, well, he's a snooker player. Let's see how he breaks the balls. Because in snooker, you don't start with a break shot like this. So it's not surprising that, you know, that it's not fully developed. When I looked at the opening table after the break and I was trying to figure out what the right pattern was, you know, we could, you and I, we could talk for a long time about how to run through this table, but man, there were so many problems with stripes and even with solids. I mean, I'm looking at it and I'm like, well, you got like 18 different problems to deal with. And I'm like, wait a second. It just dawned on me. I'm like, just the same way you have to play position to shots. You know, you don't want to sit there and leave yourself a three rail bank. And then when you miss the three rail bank, you're like, how can I do the three rail bank better? It's like, well, how do we get ourselves into this spot? I think when I saw that difficult run out, I was like, man, you'd have to be like a Filipino world champion to run through that rack. <laughs> and so we could talk about, you know, we could talk about how to develop the skills of a Filipino world champion. But really, if what you're trying to do is improve your eight ball game and competition in a real time basis, then we got to go to like, how do we get into this spot? And it was from the break shot. So I want to watch his break shot again and note, point out a couple of things. First of all, you notice he's real low on the cue, just like a shoot, like a, when you're shooting pool and especially in snooker, they all have their cue on their chin, which that's how I shoot as well. But when you're shooting a break shot, that impedes your power. So go ahead and look at this break here and you'll see that he keeps his chin on the cue and that lends itself to very good accuracy. You can see the accuracy of the hit here is real strong. So what I liked about his break was it was very accurate. And he resisted the urge to like muscle the break where he like uh, forces the cue forward and loses accuracy. He had good. It was a good stroke with good timing and an accurate hit. I think the problem is that's not going to be enough power. Like as you see, A, he came up dry and B, the balls are virtually unrunnable. So we, we need to be able to increase the power. Now for me, I'll tell you what's helped me if I could give one tip to increase the power would be. You can uh, you can sight the ball low and then raise up a good like six, eight, ten inches above the cue. Uh, and what that does is that gives you more room to, to swing your arm. Uh, it gives you a little bit more clearance. Now, there's a couple ways you could do that. A lot of the top players, they do a break where they aim and they're sighted. They're really low when they're shooting. And then as they break, they lift up. So if you watch Shane Van Boning, Tyler Steyer, James Aronis, they all sight low. And then as they break, they lift up. But now I'll tell you, Nir, I can't do that. For me, when I move my body around, when I shoot, it just doesn't work. So what I've learned to do is I sight low and then I kind of I lift up a little bit to where I want to be. 
and I actually just lock in and then I just break the balls from there. That way I'm only moving my arm when I break. So I would just say you could go ahead and sight the balls low and then kind of lift up, give yourself six, eight, 10 inches of clearance, and then go ahead and go through the cue ball and, uh, you know, try to keep moving, try to keep moving your cue stick through the cue ball. Uh, you, you do that pretty well. But for me, when I'm breaking well, um, I feel like it's, I get my cue going on the right line. And then right as I'm hitting the cue ball, I just feel like it's like a one inch punch, like a, just a little flick as I go on through the cue ball. So a little bit more clearance, accelerate through the cue ball. I think you're going to get 30, 40% more power by doing that without really sacrificing accuracy. Cool. There's only one thing I want to maybe add uh, to that, and that is with the head-on break that he's doing here. Watch the seven ball here, because when you're doing a eight ball break or breaking an eight ball rack, I should say, it's very similar to a ten ball rack, where since he's doing this pure straight dead on uh, or straight on hit, the balls in the second row have a tendency to head towards the side pockets here. So watch the seven ball. He yeah, pretty much just flew straight over there, and then it, if he had more power, would that have maybe caused it to go a little short and possibly go in? Other things to look at when you're doing uh, or when you're breaking an eight ball rack is watching the corner balls, just like with a ten ball rack, because the corner balls will go four rails around and then possibly come into the um, corner pockets here or their respected corner pockets. My only other comment, though, that I would have for his break is to just not do a complete straight on break. I would come a little bit off to one side or the other because then that also has a tendency to help other balls track towards um, pockets, just at least increasing the chances of making a ball. With this head on break here, your only really target balls are gonna be the balls that are in the second row and then the balls that are in the corner. And there's actually other balls that can be led towards pockets if you at least have some sort of an angled break uh, for an eight ball rack. Is there anything else that you want to talk about on this rack? Yeah, the the, the thing with the head ball break, uh, the head on break is uh, the six eleven, which can go four rails. Uh, if you break head on and hit them square, they'll actually kiss because they're both moving at the same speed. When you move the cue ball even just two or three inches off center, now the six eleven move at different speeds and they don't hit each other on the way around the table. Um, anyway, and uh, in this case, I don't know that he would have had enough power to get four rails with those balls anyway, but yeah, that's why sometimes just a couple inches off center, it, it creates more live tracks. Good call, Chris. All right. Let's see if we can find a, another spot in this, uh, in this rack here. All right. Here's another spot. So uh, solids had just missed the five of the corner. So you're coming to the table now with stripes and you don't have a lot to shoot at here. Uh, you've got the 11 ball, which is the shot you ended up going for. But the problem is, is that it was well, a hard shot. It's going to lead to a lot of distance on your next shot. And even if you make those first two long shots, uh, there's a lot of congestion with the 9, 10, 13, 15. It's, it's going to be very difficult to run out, particularly with the five ball blocking that corner. So when I get to the table as stripes, you know, my opponent has made five of their balls and I'm greedy. And I feel like, man, I should be able to win this game like almost all the time somehow. And, and so my first reaction is not to shoot this long, hard 11. My first question is, is there a way now that they've only got two balls on the table, they can shoot at, is there a simple safety I can play to lock up the cue ball and get ball on hand and, and maybe open up my balls at some point, I would like to combination shot my, one of my balls into that hanging five, to take their ball off the table, get control of that pocket. And so, um, so I was kind of looking at that and I'll tell you, I wasn't sure that I saw a good shot, but then Chris pointed something out to me, Chris, why don't you uh, show what you, what you told me? Well, the only thing I guessed at is like you said, if you make the 11 ball, you're going to have some sort of shot, maybe on the 14 or even the 12. But then after that, what do you do? Do you try to make the 13 into the five to take it off the table and play safe? Like, you know, all kinds of things can go wrong, just like all kinds of things could go wrong with this safety that I'm going to suggest. And that is to clip the 10 ball here. That's obviously going to push into the 15. The 15 is going to hopefully brush up next to the um, four ball. And from his angle, I think he's going to require some amount of right spin because we hope that the clip is going to cause him to hit the rail. And we want to try to spin the cue ball somewhere over into this area here to where this uh, 13 ball will still block the five. And of course the 14, maybe even the 12 ball uh, block the position uh, to the four. And like I said, all kinds of things could still go wrong. You could uh, fall a little short and have some sort of shot on the five and have to maneuver for the four. You can even come a little 
short here to where you can access the four or have a small little kick shot on the five, but then you still have to do some sort of maneuvering just to be able to try to finish the table. Now, that being said, again, had you made the 11 ball, what would, what would we have done with this clutter here? You're still going to end up giving the table um, back to your opponent at some point in time, especially if you try to do the, the 13 uh, into the 5, like Demetrius said, to be able to take this ball off the table and then hopefully see that they don't get a shot at the 4. But this was the safety that I was talking about to where you can hopefully land somewhere right around here, maybe get ball in hand, and then do the exact safety that Demetrius was talking about by knocking the 5 ball in and then trying to control the rest of the table from there, at least to be able to win his stripes. Is that about yeah, it? Yeah, when you, when you showed me this shot, I it was like, yes, this is 100% the right shot. I, I feel that I could make the 11 ball, you know, 60 to 70, probably 70% from here. But then after making the 11, uh, I'm going to be very long and I'm probably 70% to make the next ball. I mean, I'm, I'm like, I'm a favorite to make the 11 and then another ball and then get up table. But I'm, it's, it's closer to 50-50 than it is to 100% for me. So when I look at this scrape in the 10 ball and opening up these three balls, I actually think that that 15, you're right, it might tie up the four. Uh, but anyway, you're going to play that safe. I, I really, really like that safety. I think you open up your balls. You make them earn it, man. You know, when they make a bunch of open balls and then they dig themselves into a hole and don't get out, the last thing I want to do is just miss and give them an easy shot to win. And it's like, I want to make them earn it. I want to punish them for their mistake. And if either I have a good run out where I can run the table or I want to find a way to play a conservative shot that I know I can execute that I know is going to put them in a hard spot. I think you nailed it. Yeah, cool. Well, I think that's all we had for rack one because you did so well, um, at least with the opening run uh, of solids. Let's go ahead and check out rack two. All right, let's roll rack two. Okay, he, he did increase the power there on that break, but a little bit of a loss of accuracy. I think that you're, uh, yeah. Okay, so then he made a ball. He made the three. So he has solids, huh? And this rack, this rack looks much more appealing. He has a couple problems with the four ball being a little tough on the bottom rail here uh, by the side pocket and the two ball being locked up by the eight. But this is, the, I think, the right opening shot, I believe, maybe. Uh, and nice he shot. was able to put it down. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if the seven passes, if it doesn't, he might have to play the five um, and then come one rail up. It's, it's, now it's yeah, – I wonder if this is – I wonder if he could even break the two ball. Now, you'd have to use a lot of inside from here. I, as I see it now, you're getting a lot of glance angle off the five, almost like the 15's near in play if you're not careful. The alternative, I guess, is the one, but that just doesn't seem like you're going anywhere near another solid. <laughs> I don't know where the future is here. It's very touchy. You'd have to go all the way up and down, it looks like, huh? And that's what he tried to do. He tried to come all the way up and down. Okay. So now, as stripes, I'm immediately looking for problems. Everything looks open except for maybe the eight. Um, it seems like shooting the 10 and floating kind of down into the area of the 11 makes a lot of sense because then you can pick off these two balls on the end rail. Um, this is a very difficult shot to shoot for an opening shot. I'm not sure I'd want to take on something this difficult out of the gate. But then again, I didn't play Stucker for 15 years. So, <laughs> <laughs> And here, I, I wonder if he can, he's cutting this 14 knot. It doesn't look like much of a cut. I wonder if he could follow through enough to kind of go over by the, the third diamond, like straight above the 14 and get a shot at the nine. And that's kind of where he was going, but he, uh, Bounced a little far to get a shot at the nine. Oh, he could make that. I'm, I'm kind of getting confused with the, the camera. It's a little bit, you know. <laughs> yeah, the fish I feel like doesn't I, help. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I'm on a ship. I'm rocking side to side a little bit. But, yeah, he he did well to kind of hold there for the shot of the nine. He he understands that he's trying to – I see him trying to minimize his up and down movement, which is really good. I like that he cleared that half of the table. So now he has no business being over there. He just has to try to maintain everything at this end now. Yeah. And I don't know if the eight goes or not. We'll uh, we'll zoom in on this in a minute here, but let's see what he does. Oh, okay. Well, Salads is still up against it. I, if you can make the, is he going to, there's a couple shots here. I think I might take the four here 
and then use, depending on how far I slid over, the seven and the one both go in their respective corners, and each one is a good breakout. But see, that just seemed like it shoved everything together. So, but the seven still goes. If you could pocket the four, pocket the seven, you maybe you could make the two and use the five to break them open. It's, it's been, it's turned tough. Well, it was a good shot. I mean, yeah, that you was know, a really good shot. Just no reward, really. Yeah. Yeah. Now, was, that was interesting. Was he playing safe there and just opening up his balls? Possibly. Seems like it. Just you know, send the cue ball at the other end of the table like that. Yeah, look at that. It's cue ball. Yeah. And now he's going to have to deal with this 11 at some point. And he did well to get on the 10 ball. Now, here's a shot. One thing I'm very curious now is to see if he's going to use inside English to go into the end rail and then bust open the eight. See, snooker players don't use a lot of spin. And that's something that I think that when you go from snooker to pool, you have to go from vertical to horizontal. Now he's going to have some awkward combo rail first combo, maybe. Oh, he's playing well, he a little safe. No, he I tried think, it, maybe. I think he tried it. I think that was, that was supposed to be a combo. Okay. So this is a spot now where I would immediately think about protecting. Like, the last thing I want to do is give my opponent a shot at the 11-15. So let's see what he does here. He tried a shot. Ooh, and got it. Oh, he got it. Wow. Man. I guess it's in a snooker. They shoot at those side pockets. For me, that's a <laughs> – I wouldn't – he pocketed that pretty well. At least here he's on a pool table, so because if that was a snooker table, I don't think the side pocket would have accepted that shot. Okay, well, this got a little thin now. It, it just got really tough. So here, maybe you just slow roll this in, and then you, if you make it, you can cut the eight. If you miss it, you're blocking the pocket, and you leave them on the side rail where they can't really – or you could try to go back and forth, but that's – yeah, you know, it's really, really hard to get it all the way. Okay. He's a little frustrated. He didn't really take much time here, did he? He just kind of got down and that's, I mean, he hit it. I see he's frustrated because the only way I ever shoot that quick is when I'm frustrated. So maybe <laughs> he's not, I'm, I'm projecting. <clears throat> Man, look at that shot. That pace on the cue ball to get it to go up and down like that. So now when this happens, I always shake my head like I'm disgusted and I point like an inch to the right and I act like I wanted to get my cue ball there instead. Like, <laughs> is it the best shot ever? And I'm anyway, I got to teach him how what to be a shot. Ad, I have to teach him how to be an obnoxious American. OK, <laughs> well, that was at least a good recovery uh, for those two uh, stripes or the last two uh, shots there on stripes. Uh, do you got any other spots in this rack that you want to uh, pick apart? This was a fun one. He shot really well, but there was a few interesting spots. So let's zoom in on those. All right. Well, I'm actually going to start off by breaking the opening shot down uh, because usually what I like to uh, teach my teammates as well as other people that I've coached uh, in the past here is how important the opening shot is along with identifying your trouble spots. Now, in his break here, he made the three ball. So he solids. Now, I heard you already say, Demetrius, that the Four ball here is an issue, and it is because it's in it's in an isolated spot all by itself that only the one ball might be able to grant access to. And then there's the two ball tied up next to the eight. So how do we get uh, the two ball open, and then how do we get position on the four? Most likely with the one. Well, we can see here that he's going to shoot the six ball down here into this corner pocket, which he was successful, and I think he shot the one ball after that, uh, primarily because his cue ball came right about here. So his cue ball comes over to the side rail and then comes back out. So me personally, I would have liked to seen just a little bit more power because it gives me the opportunity to come over here and I want to land on this seven just so I can break out this two ball and get the and get the eight ball free. Seven ball goes here into the corner pocket. I've got the five ball here as a backup shot. I've got the one ball here as a backup shot. Maybe I'll even have a shot at the two. Nonetheless, I've got three, potentially three options and a freed up eight ball to where right after the break, I could have done a break and run. What do you think of that, Demetrius? 
Yeah. And you know, it's the, the only challenging part is coming from the six to the seven, you're kind of cutting across the shot line on the seven. It's hard to get the right speed from where he got. He could have shot the one next and gone straight to the head rail and back right towards where the one is. He was just straight up and down. Um, so like um, from right here, he could just roll the one to the side with a straight rolling ball. The cue ball is going to go straight to the head rail and straight back down towards where the one is. He's going to have an angle on the seven the whole way. Um, and if he'd gotten a little bit more straight on the one ball, he could have just rolled the one in if you get on the seven. So I think that using the one as a pivot ball to get from the six to the one and then get good on the seven or do exactly what you're saying, uh, that's that's fine too. But whether you get there in one shot or two, I think that the plan has got to be get control of the table, get on the seven, break open that two. Yep. Couldn't agree more. Let's go see if we can find another spot. I was just thinking about what he does when he comes to the table with stripes. So here he stripes and – Immediately he goes up table. And I think there's some, you know, I understand the thought process behind this. I think he's thinking that he wants to start with a 13, 14, 9 to work from one end of the table to the other end of the table and end up down with the stripes and the eight. So I think there's some logic to what he's doing. The problem is the eight ball doesn't really look like it goes right now. Um, I'm not sure that it does. And so if if the eight ball went like easily from a lot of places, then I think that uh there's a lot more that it makes more sense to start on one end of the table and work your way down. But from here, we've got to deal with this eight ball. And so I just don't see that it has a very good target. So what my first inclination and whether or not I'm right, isn't the point. It's just, I want to present you the way my brain works is I go right to the problem ball, like what Chris is saying, which is the eight, everything else goes. So I'm like, well, how do I deal with the eight? And what I saw was maybe rolling the 10 ball in and letting the, you know, kind of softly and just letting the cue ball trickle down, towards between the 15 and the 11. Even if it bumps the 11, that's fine. But I'm just going to pace this in so soft. My cue ball is not going to move far. It's just going to roll down and bump the end rail. And then I've got a shot to either, I might get lucky and pick up an angle on the 11 to where I can shoot the 11 and, and kind of just smooth into the eight ball, two ball a little bit. Or if not, I can use the 15, shoot the 15 and get the angle I need on the 11 to kind of go tickle those balls around. Um, you know, of course, <laughs> how do I break those open? Which ball am I trying to hit? What speed? That's all going to depend on exactly what angle I get and which one I have to shoot first. But but the main point is, is that I'd be trying to find a way to get down there, use one of those two balls on the bottom rail to get on the other such that I can maybe wiggle around that eight and open it up before I, because once I do that, I'm confident I can run the rest. Cool. Anything else? And then there's just that one other spot that I mentioned that side spin. Can we zoom in on that? I just kind of wanted to show him that. I think was right here. Yes, he makes a shot. Okay, so he's on this 10 ball. So we have to deal with this 11 and the 15. And I felt that by using some right spin uh, with a rolling ball, we can shoot this 11, uh, shoot this 10, and we can spin all the way to the bottom rail and catch the eight ball. Now, this takes not one tip of spin, not two tips of spin, but three tips of spin because the cue ball, you know, the cue ball is going to hit. It's, it's not going to sink. I don't even think it's going to get to quite where you're put the little, like the, it's going to hit the first rail. It's probably going to go straight up from the 10 into the first rail. So you really need a nice juicy inside English on this one. You need this ball spinning like a top. And, and if you shoot and you don't want to shoot too hard, because as you know, Chris, what happens when you shoot hard, is that it's going to, the cue ball, the top spin doesn't take, you slide along the tangent line and he's going to end up sliding even higher than that arrow right there. Uh, you know, he's going to hit even higher. So then it's going to go backwards and the spin is never going to be enough to get you the end rail. So the right speed is firm enough to go from the side rail to the end rail and just bump open the eight, but soft enough that you can roll through the tangent line and then let the spin speed you up and carry you the rest of the way. So from this distance, it's not the easiest of shots. And, it, and it's furthermore, the part of the pocket you catch with the 10 ball can change a little bit of where the cue ball goes. But for sure, from this spot, I looked at this and I knew that this is the right shot. And I suspected that coming from a snooker background, you usually the pockets aren't big enough to where you can use that much spin because with any confidence. But on pool, you've got friendly pockets. Go ahead and move that tip. One, two, three. Practice this shot a few times. If you never miss cue, you're not practicing far enough to the right. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. I really like that one. So, yeah, I think that's all we had for this rack. Like, you're, you're doing fantastic. I think you're clearing these racks at least in, like, two or three two or three innings. But let's see what we get on your final rack. All right. Let's run it. 
looking forward to rack three. Let's see his break. Can he find that sweet spot between power and accuracy? You know what? I know it's not as square as you would have liked, but it's firmer than the first one and not as uh, a little bit more controlled than the second. So absolutely, okay. I couldn't agree more. All right, so now he's looking at the problem balls. Okay, I like this. I like stripes. I don't know why. It seems like maybe because the 13 ball, or no, is that the 12? I'm sorry, the 12 ball. You have control of the top right pocket. Looks like the 10 and the 14 would go once that 13's gone. You've got a shot at the nine ball right now, If you, I think. It's hard to tell, but I think so. so and I think that I think, I think the third 12 here and this yep. is the 13 here. And for sure, the 15 is going to be able to pass. So I think, and at the 13, either it passes there, or it certainly goes to the, the pocket on the top rail by where he's standing. So I kind of like stripes. I feel like everything's open. Whereas if you took solids, you've got the three balls, a problem. The four, you know, you could make now. And I suppose you could make the four and break them open. But either way, you still got the seven, the six. You've got a lot of problems with solids. I think I would start with a soft stun shot on the nine and just try to float over for the 15 next. Um, or maybe the 13, if the 13 does go, let's see what he does. Now you've got a little bit more cut angle here than I thought. So maybe you'd have to, uh, maybe you'd have to go a little further, but I like this opening shot. So he went with a roll and I'm totally fine with that. This, this is ideal. So let's see. It seems to me that you roll this 14 in and then you can either play the 12 directly or you can even bounce off the rail and play the 12, the, the 10, 12. Both are reasonable, it seems. Oh, and if that 13 doesn't go in the bottom right, he's looking at maybe getting at it now. Which, again, honing in on those problems. But I think that 14 has got to go. Yep. I think I just roll this in softly and play for the 10, 12. It seems pretty natural. I like that. So far, we're on the same page. From the future, I'm sending my. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like it's kind of like Starlight, you know? We're looking at the position of the, the stars and we're actually looking back in time. <laughs> it's like just now we're finding out if he runs this rack. Okay, well, he got a little straight here, it appears, but there's big enough pockets, and this is close enough to the corner that you have a couple options. You can easily go rail first, or he could try to draw back for the 13 right now, which, depending on whether, I don't think, I think I'd go rail first and get up the 11 here. Yeah, I think this, for me, now he couldn't have done that up better in 100 tries, but man, that's, that's a lot to ask to hit a four-foot draw shot with, like, precision, because even still, Again, it's a little curvy, but even still, if he has to roll to where, yeah, I suppose as long as he can roll, even if he bumps that three, the 15 should kick over a little, or the 15 should kick over a little bit. I mean, that was a great shot, by the way. I'm not saying it wasn't a great shot. It was, yeah, the only problem is, I think he can make it. I think it goes. I think it goes. You got to shoot it right now. I I I think the three is in the way. I don't. Think I think he, you I could use a half tip of left with just a nice soft slide to maximize the the both. You're going to use both the cut induced and the, the side throw with that. You know, two thirds of a tip of left spin and a nice soft slide. You can twist that ball in. Maybe. <laughs> if not, the other thing you can do is when you make your bridge hand for the cue ball, you can just. Start wiggling the cloth around and see if you can separate the balls that way. <laughs> okay. Oh, what a uh, shot. That, that's a good recovery shot. Where does the eight oh. ball go, though? Does it pass the six? I'm sure it does. It's got to. If not, the guy could probably draw back into the seven and make the eight in the side. This guy's been hitting these precision draws like a beast.
did it go? It kind of, did it drift out or did it, I can't tell if he hit that straight or not because this, <laughs> that looked like I, I couldn't tell if it rolled off or if it's just the camera angle causing it to look like it rolled off or did he just not, did he just not hit it good? Okay. Now is he shooting at this or is he playing safe? Oh, nope. He shot at that. Okay. Well, we're going to have a little chat in here. <laughs> I'd be, I'd have ball on hand by now. <laughs> Okay. Uh, now this one's tough. I mean, yeah, I don't even know if this is really, really a tough spot. That's a good, I mean, there's not, kick. he made a good hit, but it turns out that he just opened up the four. That's one where there's no good answer. Like there's no intentional foul of tying up the eight. There's nothing. There's you're just in a losing spot. There's nothing to really talk about there. Okay. So this is good. I think he's going to start up here. You know, you could shoot the one and follow the rail and back out. I might do that because if you shoot the two, it's a little bit tougher to pick up the right angle on the one. You've already got the right angle, but he, if he can come back just like that, he's good. He's, he knows what he's doing. This is totally fine. Same pattern as before. He, he looks like he's going to clear uh, that half of the table and then come up and try to deal with the other half. Yeah, and the seven is the hardest ball. So if he yep. can shoot the one three and then get on the seven right away, that would be that would be brilliant. Brilliant. And then when you when you do that though, you don't want to be straight on the seven where you have to follow and play with these balls up table. So you'd like to have a ooh, hold it. Okay. Well, I'd probably just go right to the seven now. Then I think he's got an angle on the three. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I. would Maybe, maybe this is fine. If he can soft kill it. Oh, oh, well, oh, oh used all of that pocket. That doesn't go on the old six by 12. <laughs> <laughs> just, just having fun. I'm having fun near. Don't worry. I've wobbled in my share. <laughs> Ooh, okay, he got off it. Yeah, I like that. When you when you when you start second guessing yourself, stand back up and start back over. Oh. Oh golly. Like these are like perfect pace where it just like barely rolls its way in. Yeah. Your uh your backers are gonna be short on sleep though. <laughs> It's going to be, those are the ones, man. It's like, uh, yeah. Oh, he's going with the six ball here, huh? Hmm. This it works. I'm just surprised. The five ball looks like a stop shot. And then you just cut the six, go one rail. But okay. Bounce. Bounce. Oh, okay. He's. This is doable. I mean, it looks like the H. Yeah, it is. It pocket. is. It's just, yep. It's just everything's kind of like right on the, right on the border, right? Yeah. Right on the edge. Six inches short, it's no good. But here he can flow with the sand and come one or two rails. Oh, how'd he hit that one? Oh. That's about the what, 50 yard line? Nah, he's he's okay. This is okay. You gotta practice this shot where the balls the, the money ball is usually in that rack area a lot of the time. So you gotta get good at cutting this ball in from everywhere. Yeah, nicely he is. done. Like I said, wow. What a I, nice clearance. Yeah, I couldn't tell. Like I said, I think every rack was roughly somewhere between like two two to four innings. But um, I couldn't help but hear a lot of different suggestions as we were rolling by. So I'm pretty sure we got some spots that you'd like to uh, dig a little deeper on. Yeah, good shooting. Good shooting. Let's take a look. All right. Well, this one was a really good one. So he broke, pocketed a ball. And he started running stripes, and I love the way he ran the balls up until here. Now, this, what he did wasn't, wasn't bad. It was workable, and it actually goes with the theme of getting on the trouble balls as quickly as possible. He's trying to get on the trouble ball as quickly as possible. The problem is, for him to, for this to work, he has to make this shot and draw back, you know, three and a half, four feet to get on the 13, and he's got to get perfect on the 13 ball. And so, he has to get straight. If he's, if he's cutting the 13 and going like towards the 11 or towards the other side rail, that's a little tough. If he's cutting the 13 
and going into the three, which is what happened, and it could tie up or whatever. It's a little tough to play shape sometimes if you're running into that cluster. So, like, it's it's such a small target to hit with a 13 ball uh, to get on the 13 that well. And so one thing I talk about with my students is that when it comes to pattern play, there's always two things that you're balancing. How big is the target you're playing for? And how accurate is the gun that you're shooting? So sometimes, like with a stop shot, a stop shot is a very accurate gun where you can hit a really, really small target. On the other hand, if you have a shot where you're going to say thin cut a ball and go end rail to end rail up and down table, like he had to a couple racks ago, that target, that gun is not very accurate in terms of like, if you shot that shot 10 times and looked at where your cue ball ended up each time, it would be a pretty big scatter. You're playing to a bigger circle on that shot. So it's a less accurate gun. However, on a shot like that, if you can play to a big target, like anywhere on this half the table, well, then you've got a big enough target. Maybe you can hit that. So pool is always a game of knowing how accurate your, is your, you know, when you're shooting a pattern, how big of a target am I creating and how accurate is my gun? The problem with this is we've got a double, we've got an inaccurate gun to a very small target. A draw shot where you're drawing four feet, sometimes you're going to draw two feet, sometimes you're going to draw five. It's, it's, it's a, if you had to shoot the shot 10 times and look at where your scatter was, your scatter is going to be two to three feet wide at least. Meanwhile, the target you're playing for to get on the 13 up in the corner is a very, very small target to get on the 13 where you can confidently make it and run the balls out. Yeah. So it's just, it's just, too inaccurate of a gun to too tough of a target. So what I saw now, I can't quite see the end rail because of the way the, the thing is, but it looks to me like you could go rail first here with a rolling ball and a tip of left spin. And that if you could just make this shot rail first with a tip of left, um, the cue ball is going to slide up the rail like that. And once it clears the five, you're golden. If you happen to get all the way to straight in on the 11, great. If you end up a little bit below straight and you can still lay it in and take a little bit more distance. But my thought was make this shot where you can always get on the 11, use the 11 and roll forward a little bit to play shape for the 15 in the bottom right corner. And, you know, just, yeah, just roll it forward like that. That's fine. And then you just lay the 15 in the bottom right corner and and you're just going to follow one rail. And now you play to this circle. See, now the difference is you've got two differences about how you can hit that circle from out here on the 15. One is, is that uh, you have a roll shot. So a soft roll is much more accurate to control in terms of speed and direction than a draw shot. And the second part is um, you can actually use a little bit of inside English if you need to. So you actually have a little bit more control over the cue ball because you can spin off the rail various amounts. And there's one other thing I should mention, which is that the target you're shooting for has actually gotten a little bit bigger because before you had to get an angle on the 13, not to go into the three. Whereas from here, even if you got an angle on the, now, if now your, your target you're shooting, is actually a little bit bigger because if you shot the 13 and rolled into the three, you're still on the eight. So you actually are, you actually given yourself a bigger target to hit and a more accurate gun. So even though we'd like to get on our problem balls first, here's a way we can approach it to where we, we look at what is our pivotal transition is getting out of this 13 up table. And I felt that this was a way that you could, yes, you're delaying it, but you're delaying it for a good reason, which is to give yourself a better gun with a little bit bigger target. Cool. Anything else that you saw in this rack? Cause that was amazing. Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, let's look at the, um, let's look at the other spot. What was the other spot I, I mentioned to you, Chris? Uh, let's see. I think it was after he missed. Oh, the the, the, after this miss. Okay. So when I get to the table here with solids, there's a certain number where I'm like, what's what, how many games out of a hundred do I need to win from here? Like, you know, when you had that earlier, when the first rack and we talked about playing safe on the 11, instead of skimming off the balls, like, I know I'm not going to win hundred percent of the games from there. I'm, I'm trying to find a way to win as many as I can. Maybe I'd be happy winning 75% from there from here as solids. I want to win hundred percent. My guy ran six balls. He, he missed. I've got an open table. I want to win 100%. If I shoot this four ball, this is a tough shot. I'm close to it. I've got to cut it down the rail. Personally, I feel like I'm probably like, I'm, I'm probably between 50 and 75. I'm probably 60%. I'm a favorite to make it, especially the pockets are a little forgiving, but I don't have to make this ball. I mean, I'm 60%. Now, of course, not all the time I miss. Am I going to lose? Like in this case, you missed and it happened to chip the 15 down table. But if that 15 had bounced out, you know, if it had hit a little thicker and bounced out, or if it hit a little thinner, maybe the, it just 
doesn't move or, you know, the four ball hangs up and the guy can make the 15 in the same pocket after the four. There's some ways that this didn't have to work out. And I just think that when you get to the table and miss and leave your guy, you know, it, it, I just, what I would do instead is just the nip safety. I would just like thin the four, bump the end rail and just, I mean, my, my four ball would move. I would cut this. I wouldn't even, I would hit this four ball really, really thin. Like I would aim almost to hit rail first. I would just scrape the edge of the four, bump the rail and wedge. So the four ball should move about an inch and my cue ball should just move about two inches, clip the four side rail and roll up right behind the four again. If you're not like, if that shot that I just described doesn't feel like really easy, then practice it until it does feel easy. Cause that's a very common eight ball shot uh, to just aim, aim as thin as you can on the four to just scrape it going in. So the four barely moves, you bump the rail and you rock up back behind it. That's, that's how you do it because here, because that's how you win a hundred percent from here. And you don't want to hit it and move it too far because if you move it too far, people have jump cues and stuff like that. You, you don't want to give them any air, no air. I want them like purple and like, you know, mouth to mouth required. Okay. <laughs> um, the, um, after that, I just want to say the table run, once you got control of the table, on the ensuing inning, the table run was beautiful. So I'd like to do that though, without having to get away with something first. Cool. So like the only thing um, I can say about this is that in his defense, it's probably uh, or very likely that he's not thinking about playing defensive on himself uh, when, for, for to send a video in uh, for review. So going for the four, uh, going for the four ball like that, it's like, you know, offensive, offensive, offensive. Let's see how, let's see how quickly we can clear the table. If that is the case, then I still wouldn't even shoot the uh, the four ball. I would actually try to shoot the five ball here and then get the cue ball somewhere near the middle of the table. And then I've got full access of the table. If I wanted to be straight off in offensive mode, this is probably the shot that I would do instead. But if I am in competition and this is what my opponent left me, yeah, for certain, I'm definitely going to play the, uh, the four ball, as you suggested, uh, with the safety for a chance to get um, ball in hand. There's a lot of balls that my opponent would have to try to maneuver around because if you if you hide it, just like you said, there's no one rail kick. There's got to be some multiple rail kick or maybe some type of mass A swerve around the three or, or whatever. It's going to be very difficult for that stripe to get hit. And with ball in hand, you should have a pretty easy clearance uh, from there. Uh, Demetrius, uh, is there anything else that you see, um, in this rack? No, I'm good with my, uh, I think we, I think I'm good. Okay. Well then near, I think this is what we have for you, um, off of these three racks of eight ball from my end. All I can say is you played fantastically. And all I can hope for is that the advice that we were able to give, or at least basically Demetrius was able to give, cause I only gave like one or two comments, um, is what you were looking for. Um, out of this. I can only assume maybe after since a year has gone by, maybe you've already incorporated some of this stuff, but hopefully there is, there has been some things that you haven't heard yet. So therefore you can continue to, to work on from there. Demetrius, do you have any uh, closing thoughts? Yeah, I've got a couple. So um, one is that we want to, you know, so you're obviously at the level where you can run open tables. You did it here. You nearly ran out the other tables. Uh, when it comes to getting on problem balls and breaking them open. It's going to take your, your cue ball is good, but it just, it, it has to get even better uh, both in terms of controlling, like what I call the short game. When I say the short game, I'm talking about controlling how far you roll on soft rolls, how far you slide on soft stuns, just controlling it so that your, your cue ball gun gets, you know, on the soft rolls and soft stuns, your, 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 your gun goes from being like an 18 inch scatter to a 12 inch scatter. And just that little bit of being a little bit tighter is going to really do a lot for you. So I've got a, a recommendation on a drill. Uh, it's the no rail drill, where what you do is you take 15 balls, you spread them all over the table so that nothing is within, within a foot of the rail and nothing's within a foot of another ball. And then you just kind of spread them all out and then you start with ball in hand and you have to clear the table without hitting another ball or hitting a rail. And all you're using for the most part is going to be soft rolls and soft stuns and stop shots. Uh, if you start using draw shots, it's just not an accurate enough gun. You'll see if you start using draw shots, you, you'll make the ball, but you're going to start getting funny angles where it's going to quickly deteriorate. When you start doing that no rail drill, it's going to force you to do two things. One, it's going to really zoom in on your speed of your cue ball and being able to control it in tight quarters and short maneuvers very, very well. The other thing is it's going to start forcing you to plan 
even more, uh, it's going to put even more focus on the planning to where you're, you're not just looking at where you want to be, but you're looking at zones of where the acceptable range that you can get to is and starting to, you know, create targets to hit and using, you know, so you're going to be practicing your good guns and, and, and visualizing the targets and solving those racks. I think that if you do that, no rail drill a little bit, you'll see that short game come together. And that I think with a little bit better short game, you're going to start getting the angles that you want to make these breakouts more often. And the other thing I guess I'd say is we got to get you on the side of the ball. Uh, there's many times where I'd be using side spin. That's going to make the run out a lot easier. Once it, if your only tools are high, low, and you know, then, then sometimes you have to, go about the table run in a more difficult way because you don't have the tools to go another way. Um, so if I, if I was working with you, I'd, I'd have you developing your side spin shots and unlocking some different tools that you can use so that when we're looking at a run out, maybe instead of going a hard route, we could go an easier route, but it's only easier if you have those tools in your toolbox. So, you know, I'm not going to tell you in a, little recap how to develop side spin, but yeah, uh, there's plenty of little Chris has some plenty of videos on it, but I would definitely start working on using side spin to, to change how the cue ball's coming off rails on different kinds of cut shots. And um, that's something that I would work with you on is, you know, tightening up the short game and then developing a longer game for, for one and multiple rail uh, type cue ball maneuvers. Okay, great. Well, I think that's pretty much going to wrap things up uh, for this uh, coaching session here. Near, all I can say is I do apologize for it taking over a year for us to be able to uh, get to this video uh, because there are at least two or three more videos that I have left in my queue that are also a year old uh, for us to hopefully eventually uh, review here. So all I can hope is, like I said, that the information that we're able to provide, you can find useful and be able to incorporate into your game, which is already fantastic, especially with the 15 year uh, schnooker background. And then you're starting to incorporate a little bit of pull. And you can obviously tell there's a bit of a difference uh, between the two, especially when it comes to maneuvering the, the cue ball around. Demetrius, thank you so much yeah, for joining me here for another I hope he's, uh, edition. I hope I hope he's still among the living. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <Okay. laughs> it's been a lot of fun. Thanks for having me, Chris. Yeah, absolutely. So for the viewers out there, you know how we like to do this. If there is anything that you agree or disagree with, please feel free to leave a comment in the comment section below with the timestamp of the shot of where you would like to give some sort of advice or would like to create some sort of dialogue with any of the suggestions that I or Demetrius uh, may have made. And if you like what you saw here, please give this video a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe. Be sure to click the bell notification icon to be notified whenever I go live or publish a new video. And then also be sure to check out Demetrius's YouTube channel, MN Pool Bootcamp, and then also check out his website and possibly take uh, or sign up for his boot camps. Take care, everybody. Thanks.